I grew up reading comics, and when I lost my sight, I had made up all these rules that I would get bionic hearing. And as I'm sad to report, I didn't. <laughs> there are those who have exceptional hearing, but generally what I've experienced is that most, most blind people don't, including myself. There are three basic skills to being an independent blind person. There's, you know, reading, and then there's adaptive equipment, and then there's your mobility. And to me, that's the one where I put the most emphasis. Prior to losing my sight, I lived a very active style. I've always taken martial arts, dance, loved to walk, and I wanted to just get back out there again. I had goals for myself. I wanted to be back in society. I wanted to go back to work. And I knew that putting all my energy into these, this retraining was important. Our organization, Guide Dogs for the Blind, exists to create independence through partnership. It's partnership with these amazing guys, these dogs, our clients in the community. The most common question that I get is, how does the dog know when to cross the street? And in actuality, the dog doesn't know when to cross the street. The individual handler is the leader of the team. They use their auditory skills, and some of our uh, clients have a little bit of limited vision, so that, that combined with the auditory skills, and they listen to the traffic patterns, and uh, then they command the dog to go across the street. So that's one misconception. I think another misconception about blindness is, uh, for some people, is they think blindness is, is darkness total block out of any, any light perception or any ability of uh, having any vision. And we have a whole spectrum of clients that, uh, you know, at one end it could be, you know, total darkness, um, no vision at all. And at the other end of the spectrum, they might have, a, you know, a considerable amount of vision, but it might be maybe in a pinhole or a narrow range. And, uh, and so it can be unsafe for them to detect things like stairs, elevation changes, obstacles, things like that. As I was growing up, I've been legally blind all my life. I learned how to use a white cane to get around safely, which was great for getting around safely, but people don't want to come up and pet your white cane, right? So um, having a guide dog has really brought me a lot of social contact that I might not have had before. It's absolutely okay to come up and approach someone with a guide dog, but what you want to do before petting a guide dog is always ask first because if the person is walking with a guide dog and you distract their dog, it would be like someone grabbing your steering wheel while you're driving. Puppy socialization is critically important in creating successful guides. Believe it or not, puppy socialization starts at week one, and that's with holding them, getting them used to human touch, feeling comfortable with people, and then once mommy weans them, usually between four and five weeks, they come into our puppy socialization kennel where they get big time socialization. They're introduced to all kinds of surfaces, noises, um, different types of toys, different things, hanging, leash training. The first nine weeks of life are critically important for making certain that these guys are going to be prepared for the world. I think that Labradors and Golden Retrievers are excellent guide dogs because they really want to please you, they're smart, and they come in many different types. So there's fast ones and slow ones, there's um, excitable ones and really mellow ones. So they match lots of different people with lots of different personalities and needs. Yeah, how we train the guide dogs is, first of all, we start with the, the breeding process here on our campus. All of our dogs are bred here. And then they're raised by volunteer families where they're socialized and introduced to various different aspects. Uh, once they're about 15 months old, they come back to our campus and they're trained in a 10-week program. Some dogs are more food motivated than others and some dogs are toy motivated, but uh, these are Labradors and uh, Golden Retrievers, so they're pretty interested in food and that's a primary reinforcer, so we use that pretty much exclusively when we're teaching them new skills. Intelligent disobedience is a concept that we teach through a lot of repetition and it's where the dog um, makes an intelligent decision to disregard what the handler has instructed them to do in order to keep them safe. So an example of that would be, let's just say there's a traffic scenario and uh, the dog is asked to cross the street and, and all of a sudden a, a car cuts in front of them. So the dog will make a decision to maybe not go into the street 
and refuse the command, and that's intelligent disobedience. It's very difficult to express what guide dogs have meant to my life over the 15 years or so that I've been working with guide dogs. My first guide dog was Blossom. And for me, getting Blossom was probably like a 16-year-old getting their driver's license for the first time because the freedom that it gave me was amazing. I could go where I wanted to go. I could have fun doing it. I wasn't stressed out about it. It took all the anxiety away from me as far as getting around independently. So having a guide dog has really given me freedom and it's really hard to find the words to express how much that's meant to my life. Guide Docs for the Blind serves individuals from the United States and Canada. For more information, visit guidedocs.com or call 1-800-295-4050.